Well, on this Friday evening, the clouds are hanging tough here in Texas. But let's take a look at the surface map and get the big picture. The chart for this afternoon shows a reinforcing shot of cold air across the Midwest and a very cold 19 degrees there at Chicago and a little bit warmer there at Detroit with 34. But just to the north, teens and single digits up near Lake Superior. We've got a major weather system moving through California. It's not really that deep, the central pressure about 10.04 but much of the Pacific air has invaded the northern two-thirds of California. And down to the south, a little bit of tropical air still hanging on there. You'll see that we have southwesterly flow in those areas, very gusty, and that's what we tend to see right before these fronts pass through. In Texas, that stationary front hanging on along the Gulf Coast, but it has made an advance through San Antonio, where the temperature is up to 78 degrees at this hour. Down around McAllen and Laredo, temperatures are above 80. So that's quite a change from Chicago up to the north. So you can pretty much look at that, compare that to Chicago, and you're going to have to analyze a cold front somewhere along that line. And of course, it's going to be right in here. And before we start looking at things closer, let's check Canada. Well, there is a small blob of Arctic air on the move. That's it right there. It's basically polar air that has gained a little bit of strength in the past couple of days. Now, we're not really expecting that to come south. Most likely, it's going to advance into Alberta and Saskatchewan and then recurve towards the east. Not much of a change for the Hudson Bay coast, though where temperatures are minus 10 to minus 20. And that'll leave the United States dominated by strong westerly flow and a storm track coming from the southwest into the east coast region. Yep, you know that when you see this chart, we mean business. We're going to get in there and take a look at that hemispheric overview of what's happening. This is the general circulation to some extent. We can kind of see the playbook for everything that's happening. This is up at 300 millibars, up the top of the troposphere near 30,000 feet. So what do we see here? We see the polar vortex. I'm going to outline that for you. The polar vortex is not a massive winter storm that rages like in Chicago or something like that. It's actually the large-scale vortex that we find in the polar regions during the wintertime. Now, the strongest polar vortex I'm finding right there, that's pretty much it, and it's sitting over Siberia. You can see that's on the other side of the North Pole. Now, there are a few lobes. I mean, these could be called polar vortexes, too. There's one there in Hudson Bay. There's another north of Scotland but they're not quite as strong. This is the main one, and that's got the bulk of the cold air by far. Now, we're going to keep an eye on that, and we're also going to watch the general flow coming in from the Pacific. We can see that it is progressive with a large number of waves. There's a trough right there. There's a trough here. Here's a trough. It's kind of like Old McDonald had a farm full of troughs, and there's a bunch of them. And it's also broken up into these little cutoff flows. These are smaller scale waves. And it seems like every time we've had one of these smaller scale troughs go around the large scale ridge, it carves off a cutoff flow on the other side. So you might see a little bit of that as we go forward. But there is going to be a pattern shift. And let's run this forward over the next one to two weeks. And you can see that trough there off the west coast. That's shearing on off and producing a little cutoff flow down there in Nevada. And here comes another one off the coast of Washington. That one's shearing off also. There's a pretty good trough there in California on next Friday. And it looks like we're getting into a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a Rex block right there near the Aleutians. Once we get blocks, that tends to kind of lock the large-scale waves into place. But surprisingly, things are moving. Now, we get to the end of this, and, you know, this is 318 hours out. We don't 
start looking at winter storms or high pressure outbreaks into the U.S., we don't look at that that far out, but it can be useful for looking at the large scale picture. Have you noticed a change here? Well, let's outline that that polar vortex. Huh, okay, it shifted over to North America. Okay, so that's going to have some relevance as we get into February. So let's see about when that happened. Let me back this up. So this is 216 hours out. This is within the range of accuracy on the GFS. So this definitely points to a pattern shift. So the polar vortex right there on the 31st, and let's back that up further. And it looks like it hopped over sometime late next week. So what that tells us is we're going to get into a slightly different pattern in the first week of February. Now, we don't know the details. One thing that I'm seeing just paging through the long-range models is that there is a lot of cold air up to the north, but it doesn't really move south within the range of these model runs. So if that's going to happen, either we don't know about it or it's going to happen later on. But it will be cold in February up in the northern Canadian regions and Alaska as well. This whole area is going to fall down below seasonal normals. And one reason it's not coming south is you can see this very strong jet here. We've got 100 to 150 knot jet flowing right across the west coast into the eastern U.S. And with that high zonal component, that's going to make it really hard for this cold air to move south. Usually it's just going to kick eastward into the Labrador Sea or it's just going to kind of recycle out over the northern regions. So those are some of the problems we're going to be looking at in February. And as far as exact details, we just do not know. But in the near term, I'm going to show you something very interesting. I know this is kind of hard to see, and I apologize. I don't have a overlay or anything like that. But that's China right there. There's Korea. There's the Siberian coast. The Kamchatka Peninsula, northern Siberia like that. Then over here you have Alaska. Let me get that drawn. And the Aleutians right through here. Just kind of a, a small patchwork of islands. And then we have the west coast and then northern Canada. Okay, so Hawaii down here, Japan over here. So try to memorize that as we go through, because I'm going to drop this so we can watch what happens. Okay, down there in Asia, we've got obviously a f polar front. You see that banding there of the blue thickness lines, and actually there's red thickness lines, so it probably goes a little further south. So we're looking at this area right here. That's going to be the the polar front. And that connects back up into here. Becomes a warm front through here, broken up by the anticyclone, and then we pick it back up there in California. So this kind of rings the globe to a certain extent. Now, what we're going to watch here is this low pressure area in Japan. This has the potential to become another record setting storm next week. And let's watch it come together. Here it is, a 10.05 millibar low. That's nothing to write home about, but you can see as it interacts with that cold air coming off of the Siberian coast, it starts undergoing bear clinic development. You can see those pressures falling, 997 millibars. This is off the east coast of Japan, and it starts moving towards the northeast, and we're talking about this system right here. Now watch as it approaches it. Whoop, lost it there. Yeah, watch as it approaches the Aleutians here. So we're up to Monday, and you're going to see the so-called bomb, uh, meteorological bomb, take effect there. 960 millibars on Tuesday morning, and dropping rapidly to 945, 938, and 936. And I think that's, uh, yeah, 930, 935 millibars is about as low as it gets. Now, we can't really compare that with hurricanes because the Coriolis force up north is different. But if this was further south, that would be a Category 4 storm. In terms of northern latitude development, yeah, that's definitely very strong. A couple of weeks ago, around January 1st, we had that 925, I think, millibar storm. So this isn't going to be quite as deep as that. But this is 100 hours out, and 
this forecast could change. It could go lower. It could go higher. It's definitely going to be something to watch, and we'll have to check back in on Tuesday and Wednesday to look at things at Shemya and pull up those METAR observations. And there's how it goes. Moves into the Bering Sea and then occludes and decays because it's cut off from the thermal zones out to the east. And as you can see, things are definitely active there in California and Nevada. Mountain wave activity definitely indicated there on the satellite imagery. And I think the cold front is going to be set up roughly like this from about Coldale, Nevada, down to Bishop, and then maybe down towards Lancaster, California. You can see how the cloud fields on either side have a different appearance. Here it's mostly mid and upper level cloud. Back behind it, it's a lot of deep cumuliform clouds, including along that cold front up there in Nevada. Now the turbulence is not too bad. There's a couple of sporadic reports. Las Vegas reporting some wind changes after takeoff. Mountain waves are reported in the Mono Lake area by a 737 there, up at 40,000 feet. And checking out those observations, we can really see that cyclonic flow into the Fallon area of Nevada. That's going to be the main low pressure area. And then further south, we have some of the baroclinic segments of that frontal system. And the observations match up pretty well with what I said there. You can see back behind it, northwesterly flow, cooler conditions, 59 there at Bakersfield, and out ahead of it, a little bit warmer there. Not seeing 70s or 80s, because as you can see, this is onshore flow. This is not like Santa Ana winds, but it is fairly mild. And another area I wanted to look at was Texas. Where is that front? Well, definitely wherever we have 80s, Catula, Corpus Christi, that's going to be in the tropical air. But if, if you go north, pretend you're in a car taking a trip, you can see we hit 79 there south of Austin. That's in this area here. Then it drops off to 76 and then 64. So obviously, we have crossed into the cold air. We can do a similar thing there around Hondo, Kerrville, and we can see it gradually drops off. Well, the front is going to be located where we first encounter that transition. So it's going to be down in this area here. I should actually draw that in blue. So that right there is going to be the location of the front. And I'm calling that a stationary front because it's been in that same general area for a couple days now. Okay, so let's run the forecast and see what's coming up. First, let's check out those boundaries. Remember, we have that one through Texas. And we can see that's on the southern side of this thermal gradient that goes all the way into the Great Lakes, not much on the south side. Now, it is a little bit more tricky out west because the thermal gradient runs like that. What's happening is that, yeah, there's a frontal boundary down to the south. It's not as obvious, but we have this reinforcing shot of cold air. So there's a new boundary right up there in California. Interestingly, it doesn't show up that well on this depiction, but if you go over to over to Pivotal Weather, it seems to show up just a tiny bit better. Those two lines there, right there in the Sierra Nevadas. And a lot of times as you step forward, these fronts will tend to undergo frontogenesis and become a little bit more obvious. So running that forward, let's see what happens. Well, yeah, it appears that there is some frontogenesis starting to show up right there. It looks like our system has moved through Arizona on Saturday, and now we're at Sunday morning. So this is the area we're going to be watching right in here. That's the front crossing the southern Rockies. Looks like another front up to the north. It may connect back up into the system. I'm not sure. But, yeah, there's that system right there in Kansas. And then in Texas, we've got southerly flow. So we're bringing up the moisture in advance of this next system. So eventually that will come out into Texas, and you can see the precip gets going. So now we're up to Sunday morning, and the fronts are looking like that. 
This is going to come through Dallas-Fort Worth early on Monday. So we're not going to be dealing with a whole lot of instability. See, there's Dawn, and already by afternoon, it's moved eastward towards Mississippi. So there's the front right there. However, with a strong warm air advection, the lift near the warm front, the backed winds, there could be a chance of some strong thunderstorms in Tennessee, Kentucky, the boot heel of Missouri. That's something we'll have to watch for. Also, this wraparound may be cold enough for some snow up there at Kansas City. Now, we've turned our back on California, but you can see it's busy out there once again. This is an even more potent system, and we'll take this back all the way to Sunday. There it is. There's the next system coming into California. This is Sunday night. And then moving forward, you can see that coming together. Systems probably like that. Maybe even a little further south. In any case, it does get very busy in that region. And snows for the mountains of Arizona and Nevada, Utah, New Mexico. And then it crosses over. You can see that front of Genesis going on in here, strengthening that front, and then it emerges into Texas. Looks like the boundaries are kind of like that. Not as obvious. Looks like it's kind of crossed over as an upper level front, and then it emerges on Wednesday night there around Tennessee. So that's interesting. It's stronger for California, but not so much for the central U.S. next week. And then California getting another system. And man, look at those Sierra Nevadas lighting up there with snow. So that'll be something we'll be talking about next week for sure. So yeah, anyway, we're up to about 15 or 16 minutes, and I think that's probably a good time to stop. I do want to thank you for watching Forecast Lab. And just as a reminder, on Monday, we're going to do a special behind the scenes showing how we do the production and set up the software and the editing. And you can see that only if you are a supporter. So follow this link to Patreon and sign yourself up as a supporter and help keep this program as my top priority. And we'll keep this program going. So give that some thought. Again, that'll be Monday, and if you're a supporter, you will automatically get that via the Patreon notifications. Okay, so have a great Friday. Hope you've got some fun stuff planned this weekend. All right, take care. We will see you Monday for the supporters and Tuesday for everybody else. Take care. Bye-bye.